Hi, I'm Gabor Nagy, Head of Product and Marketing. Welcome to learn about our products. This lecture today is a detailed introduction of the Trait Map Personality Assessment. This talk will give you all the knowledge you need to use Trait Map in a recruitment or development setting. I advise you to take notes, stop the video time to time and come back to the important parts and watch it again. There's a lot of content here, but the good news is that everything you need, the full material of the certification training is included in this lecture. The best is probably to watch it on YouTube, where you can see the bookmarks below the video and you can jump between the section. What is trait map? This is the summary, a high level definition of the trait map personality inventory. We are going to define each concept in detail later. Here on the screen you can see some words are underscored. These are the most important concepts. So of course first personality. Inventory is just another word for a questionnaire or assessment and usually it's used for broad bandwidth questionnaires and broad bandwidth means that trait map has trait map measures many traits not just a few actually 25 so it's quite a lot so it provides a high resolution picture of personality trait map is a big five based personality questionnaire. Its model has five traits in each big five dimensions. The main outcome of trait map, the main result is identifying the cardinal traits, the traits that are most influential for someone's behavior. Trait map uses a unique fourth choice questionnaire format and it is a work-oriented questionnaire which uses a relatively simple language. So in this video I'm going to use some concepts like fourth choice questionnaire and cardinal traits, big five. And now in the report these concepts are either explained or they are not there. So this video is not for the people who use the question not for the participants but for the administrator for the coach for the HR person who is administering this who provides feedbacks and who provides advisory to managers and the people what is the importance of a personality assessment why do we want to measure personality I like to start from a broader view of assessment the main objective of assessments in, a, in the corporate world is performance prediction, is analysis, is to, is to have a better picture, more data about predicting performance. And we are using a, this, the following logic. So performance can be predicted from behavior over a longer time period. Not what you do once will make the difference over a longer time, but, but things that you do over and over, things that uh, you do regularly. So these longer time patterns are more important in predicting performance. And we have a formula for that. In the brackets, you see competencies and using the language of assessments. So usually there are tests around IQ. They are running under the name of aptitude tests because they measure certain IQ facets, for example, abstract reasoning test or verbal reasoning test. And then personality. We are going to talk a lot about that a lot. EQ, our ability to understand emotions, to identify emotions and to utilize them. Then skills, hard skills, soft skills and knowledge and all that in a bracket. 
because these are the competences that the individual brings with him or her and this is multiplied by motivation and by platform and here the platform means the situational factors like the company the industry the opportunities the leadership and so on so when we look at this formula we need to realize two things that yes personality is part of it we bring our personality always with us we cannot leave it uh, at home in the cupboard and we also need to realize that personality is not the only thing that we bring with us and influences behavior and this is very important to understand the relationship between behavior and personality personality doesn't equal behavior it is one of the predictors of behavior what is personality this slide provides a definition which is based on trait theory and it's important to know that there are also other approaches about personality there is a psychoanalytical approach there's a behaviorist approach a humanistic approach evolutionary approach and these approaches and these definitions of personality and the tools that are used and the implications are quite different so trait theory is not the only approach and this is good to know because when we are looking at a trait map profile this is not the total truth and everything about a person not at all there are other important approaches to make our understanding of people more complete and actually even with this all these approaches we are just trying to understand and somehow study people who are complex beings so a trade map report is not the final truth about uh, someone's uh, someone's essence and potential on this planet there are advantages of the trade theory one is that trade theory has relatively simple models and the models of trade theory go well with questionnaires it is a quantitative approach which is very compatible with management engineering and scientific thinking so compared to for example the psychoanalytical approach the trade theory is definitely more simple so let's use the trade theory's definition of personality it's a proclivity towards certain patterns of behavior thought and emotion it means that there is an inclination a preference or a habit towards certain patterns opposed to others and we mentioned traits so what are traits traits are names and descriptions of the patterns in behavior thought and emotion so the person they are these patterns and each of these patterns has a name has a category with a description and that is a trait so a trait is the building block of personality personality is in the trait theory built up of different traits the traits are the ingredients just like and there, that's why you see a cocktail uh, picture uh, on the right just like a cocktail has certain ingredients and which ingre ingredients do you use and in what amount will define the flavor of this cocktail another metaphor that is used is a piano keyboard on a piano keyboard there's a certain amount of keys i think 88 or something like that and how often do you play certain keys how hard you press them uh, how long you press them will define the music that comes out there is a fixed amount of keys this is actually very close to 
uh, our trade map approach. So trade map has 25 traits. You can imagine as 25 keys on the keyboard. And the amount that you are using, that you, that you are pressing each key, defines the music. The trade map is kind of the music note, is the note which says, okay, in your personality, in your music, in your mix, in your cocktail, what is the amount of the different traits? So we said traits are patterns of behavior with a name and descriptions. Here are a few examples. For example, calmness, that's the name of the trait. And we have a description for the left score or low score behavior or right score or high score behavior. We prefer to use left score and right score to emphasize that there's no good and bad. The, the higher score not necessarily is better than, than the lower score. These are about characteristics and not a quality judgment. Left and right has nothing to do with political inclination or with uh, the left brain or the right brain. Nothing, just on the paper, on the left side is one description and on the right is, is the other. Just to differentiate that. So for calmness, the left score behavior is person who scores one or two or three has the individual difference compared with others that he feels more tense before important occasions. These feelings are uh, happening more often and relatively lower challenge also induces tension. While the right score behavior is people who score high, they experience less frequently tension and bigger challenges cause less uh, less tension so or let's see liveliness people who score low in liveliness they are more reserved in their social interactions it takes more time to warm up to others they prefer to have their time to process things while high scorers are vivid they are thriving on social interactions they are entertaining, humorous, animated, they attract the eyeballs and they are the life of the party. Or creativity. Creativity is about how often we generate ideas and how imaginative, how original are these ideas. And low scorers, they use their creative side less. They less often put forward original ideas. And high scorers are highly imaginative, they have very rich fantasy and they often come up with new and original ideas. An important thing to know about traits that they are normally distributed in the population. So what does that mean? If you look at this chart, which is a frequency chart, then you see how many people scored in the population one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Traits are very often expressed in scores and in 10 scores, standard 10. So here uh, we see also a system which divides liveliness into 10 scores. And the lower score shows less degree, less amount of liveliness less amount of the liveliness ingredient in the personality and higher score shows higher and five and six are about average amount of liveliness in the mix and eight nine uh, would be a definite inclination towards being humorous and entertaining and ten would be an extreme amount of that and on the other direction, two and three shows a definite preference of being uh, more reserved. And the percentages below the numbers show that how many percent 
of people in the population will score 1, 2 and so on. And this is really interesting because it doesn't matter which trait are we measuring using questionnaires if the trait is well defined, if our questionnaires are well developed and if we transform our raw results into standard 10 then we mostly get a normal distribution now sometimes it's a little bit skewed uh, a little bit more to the left and right and so on but something like this and this is very significant because not everything in nature is distributed normally but traits they are it's also important to notice that 5 and 6, which is around the average, have each of them around 90% of the population scoring 5 and 6. So it means that uh, average people are the most. Most of us are average. <laughs> this is not a surprise. So when we say average, it's not a bad thing. Maybe when you hear oh, you're average, Maybe it's not inspiring, but when it's about personality and traits, actually, most people are average. And on some traits, you will score higher or lower. These are the so-called cardinal traits. So where you are 8, 9, 10 or 1, 2, 3, these are the traits that have more influence on your behavior. You have more inclination to behave in certain ways. We can see that 68% are kind of central, 5, 6 and 4, 7. And then about 13.5% 2, 3 and 13.5% 1, 9, 8 and 9. So that's where they have stronger inclination and 2.5% is 10 and 2.5% is 1. So the very strong tendencies uh, only around 2% of the population has it in each directions. The gray bars on the top of the, of the scores represent graphically how many percent of the population has that certain score. And as you see, the gray bars are growing towards the middle. Five, six are the highest and then getting less. And if you would connect it, then you would get a nice bell-shaped curve. And this is beautiful because it works with all traits and all questionnaires. So this is, this is also one of the big advantages of the trait theory, that some principles are really consistent and they appear through many studies. I need to talk a little bit more about the scores. So what does it mean that, for example, somebody has, let's say, five? In this picture, you see somebody who is kind of scoring on average. Actually, this would be the most typical score. So most people around 38 percent, as we as we saw in the previous slide, would score five, six. And let's say this person is really in the middle and because of rounding we will give him a score of five what does it mean in terms of behavior it means that he has around equal degree of inclination to both the left side behavior and the right side behavior and this we can graphically represent imagining that the person is represented by a ball a green ball here and the ball is on a hill and the valley, the deepest point of the valley is where the score is, here represented by a pole. So where you see this pole, that is the score. And the behavior will be moving, will be flexing at both sides. So with a score of five or six, it will take the exactly the same amount of energy and motivation to move to both directions. So 
when somebody scores five and six we say that the behavior is flexible central and will seldom go to the extreme because as you see the further it goes the more steep it becomes and you need the more energy more motivation to go higher more skills and also the pull towards come back to the home base is greater so in this example if somebody scores five it means that liveliness is not a cardinal trait of this person he's average he's like most people when it comes to liveliness he has the same inclination towards be reserved or to be very vivid and humorous so how it would appear it would appear that he behaves depending on the situation sometimes more focused more reserved takes more time and personal space and sometimes he is uh, more warm and animated and humorous and thriving on social interactions so let's take another example in this example the person scores three on liveliness so what does a score of three mean we can represent that again with the metaphor of a hill and a valley and this time the lowest point of the valley is at three so that is the home base that is the most comfortable behavioral pattern so we can see that this person prefers uh, to be a bit more reserved and opening up more slowly and uh, seldom animated and seldom humorous and entertaining and we can see that the behavior as it would flex around this midpoint is quite easy to go to one to be very reserved and uh, not saying much and if the behavior needs to go to 9 or 10 then it is far away and it is very steep and needs a lot of energy motivation and skills to get up there for example let's say this person needs to be the MC of the annual company dinner can he do that can he be the MC maybe for some reason the company selected that he should be the MC well just because of personality we cannot say that he cannot be a good MC and if the person has the right motivation and has the social intelligence EQ IQ and prepares well might do a brilliant MC job he can perform the MC role which requires 9 and 10 on the liveliness scale he can perform that but he can perform it only for that night and definitely after that night he will feel quite exhausted and probably he doesn't want to repeat this experience while the person who would be 9 and 10 would require less efforts to be the MC would probably enjoy it more would become less exhausted and want to repeat that experience more but as we can see from this example personality cannot be an, ex an excuse for low performance yes your personality maybe didn't give you the most gifts or the best support for certain tasks but the task has to be done so there's no excuse you should be able to do the task at the same time we can also see that the best use of the person would be here in this case not to be an MC all the time the majority of his work should use his cardinal traits his advantages which are not at the liveliness so probably in somewhere else in some other traits let's take another example and let's look at another metaphor to illustrate behavior and this metaphor is rubber band so this time 
there is no valley and hill, there are no balls, just the person standing there and the pole represents the score and this time this person scores 9 on liveliness. So he is typically very vivid, humorous, animated, entertaining. And that is his most typical comfortable behavior, so his home base is 9. And imagine that there is a rubber band attached to this pole, which is fixed at 9. So when he performs, for example, he is the MC and he is the most uh, vivid and brilliant, thriving MC. When he uh, performs at a 10, it is not a very big distance from the home base. So it's quite easy. The behavior can flex easily around the home base. However, when this person, for example, needs to be quiet, let's say, do an interview where he's not supposed to talk much, just be a quiet observer and should focus on his energy just on observing and taking notes, or maybe another task, he needs to focus on some something, some tedious tasks that maybe uh, he is scoring low in that area. For example, doing the um, finance expense reports, then that will take a lot of motivation and energy from for this person, and that will feel a little bit painful, and uh, he doesn't want to repeat that experience if possible. And that is represented by the rubber band is stretch far, far, and the far further you stretch the rubber band, the bigger strength you need and the bigger is the pull coming back. And with that now you have two metaphors that you can use. One is the hill and valley picture and another one is the rubber band to understand, to imagine and explain what scores really mean. Having laid the foundation, understanding what traits mean, a definition, then a number, and we have this image of how the behavior is flexing around that home base number, we can compare now traits and types systems. For example, MBTI, not step two, just the normal step one MBTI, is using a questionnaire to put people into one of two buckets on every dimension. The most well-known dimension is extroversion, and people who score low are put into the introvert bucket, score high extrovert bucket. These are the two labels. And having only two labels makes the system very simple. The test is simple, only one decision has to be made, introvert or extrovert. And this simplicity actually is a big advantage and that's why our language is also using this. We, in every day we say, oh, he's an introvert, she's an extrovert. And we seldom say, her extroversion score is 3 <laughs> which actually would be much more accurate as we see uh, because when we use that simple approach we sacrifice a lot on accuracy just imagine we know that most people score 5 and 6 or if we look at a bit a broader range in the middle 4, 5, 6, 7 and these people, their behavior is flexing between introversion and extroversion. Where are they in the type system? In one bucket or in another bucket? Wherever they are, uh, there is definitely an inaccuracy there. And there is another issue too. For example, let's say the introvert people. Somebody scored one on a trait system or five they are both put into the introvert bucket 
they are all labeled as introverts. However, the difference between them is significant, it's very big. And the difference between somebody who in a trait system would, would score 5 and, or 6 is very little, but they would be in different buckets. They would have different labels. So we see that the type system is simple, but it has very big limitations. And the trait system provides a, a more sophisticated, more accurate uh, representation. So now as you understand the advantages of traits over types, you probably want to ask the question, okay, but which traits are the most important? Which traits should we look at? Which traits should we measure? And how many traits are there? How many traits should we measure? Personality psychologists worked out different models with more and less traits. Some has only 4, some has 16, some has 48. And they, it, it is very difficult to compare these and the personality psychology field and of course all, and also the practitioners were quite uh, confused about so many different systems. There was a question, is there some commonality? Can we find a common ground? Some of the traits in the different systems overlap. This question, this common ground, uh, was found by a mathematical method called factor analysis that was applied to large and broad personality datasets in different languages using different tools or different methods and there was some kind of commonality in the result. Factor analysis is a method that can find clusters in data that can see what are the things that correlate, that move together, so probably they belong kind of to the same family. For example, this method, factor analysis, uh, led to the discovery or the proof of the concept of general mental ability, the central G factor. And this method was also very, very fruitful when it was applied to personality testing data. And now there is a wide and strong consensus among personality psychologists that when it comes to traits, there are five super traits. And these are called the big five. And the cool thing about the big five is that the same or similar structures appeared in very diverse languages, in European languages, in English language, and in Chinese and Asian languages as well. Usually there are six or seven or more, more factors, but the most important five factors are usually the same. They are the big five. And the big five is defined mostly um, in the academic liter literature and also if you on Wikipedia you check the big five actually the academic description I just copied it from Wikipedia then you see these five names and usually they put in an order of an acronym OCEAN so openness to experience here on the left side conscientiousness E O C E A N OCEAN easy to remember. And on the right of this slide you can see the trait map versions of the five dimensions and they are somewhat different. I want to explain why our names and definitions are a little bit different. The reason of the difference is that our population, people who do our questionnaires, are not the generic population. Our population are people who work in corporations. 
our clients, the companies that use TradeMap and use advanced uh, people selection and development processes are usually the best or very leading in their fields. And their employees are talented ones. Usually they have a very big competition when, when they have an opening. They can select people. So our population is not the generic population. So let's go through the big five. Openness, it's very similar, uh, our definition. But conscientiousness, if you see it on the left, and on the right, focus and the definitions are quite different. Why we use a different word? First, to show that our concept is a bit different. And the second is conscientiousness is a word that for non-native speakers is difficult to pronounce. And TradeMap is a instrument that is should be easy to, to use, easy to read. So we stay away from those um, names, from those terminology of psychology and use something that is more easy for people. The other reason is you can see the definition is different as well. So the academic one is easygoing, careless, versus efficient and organized. So if we would use an academic questionnaire with the academic academic definitions, in our population, we wouldn't have a normal distribution because these corporations don't select the careless and easygoing people or select much less of them. Therefore, we had to redefine the definition of our traits and also the content of our questions. So our focus scale is somewhat different. The other reason is uh, our skills and our traits and there is no real right and wrong. While with the academic consciousness, conscientiousness in a corporate corporate context, careless is definitely wrong. Then extroversion, very similar. Agreeableness, fairly similar. And then the last one, the academic, is neuroticism, the name. While, we, while a trait map, we have emotional stability, the name. And again, here, just as is focus, it is not only a different word, but also a different approach. Our names are all positive or neutral. While neuroticism, the name already is negatively sounding. And somebody who scores high on neuroticism is definitely not a good not a good sign. Neurotism, this language, is coming from the psychiatry, medical language. It's not suitable in the corporate world. And trait map is not a questionnaire that can make such a diagnosis. So we are staying, we are we don't want these medical concepts because we are not a diagnostic, medical diagnostic instrument. And our definition is really no absolute right and wrong answers and, and profiles. So our definition and the content of our questions and report is different. We have emotional stability while the high scorer is more optimistic and confident. And the low scorer are more alert, vigilant, but it's not a negative, it's not something to be ashamed of. So in summary, I'd like to say that trait map is following the currently dominant standard, the big five. Our traits are arranged in the five super dimensions. However, because of our population and purpose is focusing on the world of work, uh, we modified some of the 
definitions of the five traits and definitely our item contents and report contents are different from the academic approach. This slide shows you the, the 25 traits of trait map arranged in the big five. The order of the trait map big five is not arranged according to the ocean because we have different names so our acronyms are a little bit different anyway it would be different and there's also another reason so the sequence in our report is emotional stability extroversion agreeableness focus openness and the reason for that is we wanted to have emotional stability the fifth trait is confidence we wanted to have it very close to assertiveness which is the first trait of extroversion because they correlate and the last trait of agreeableness competitiveness we wanted to wanted it to be close to the first trait of focus drive because these two are also correlating so we had a bit different uh, priorities different ideas how we arranged our big five if you look into your report you see the definition of each of the 25 traits i'm not going to define all the 25 traits i just mentioned now a few interesting ones that might be a little bit different than uh, what you would think or very innovative so for example the emotional stability group the third one health management this is a very innovative trait I don't know any other questionnaire that would have this trait so I'm going to explain it a little bit health management refers to how consciously somebody keeps good care of his body maintains a regular lifestyle pays a lot of attention to stay healthy and a high score doesn't mean that somebody is very healthy it just means that pays a lot of attention to healthy lifestyle maybe he does it because he has health issues so it's not it doesn't equal with health and a low score somebody scores one or two it doesn't mean that the health is bad it only show only shows that this person doesn't put so much emphasis doesn't pay so much attention to a healthy lifestyle next one the extroversion big five dimension their activity level may require a little little explanation so activity level refers to the speed how quickly somebody is doing things a high score indicate somebody who is very quick energetic and can do multitasking or does many things typically gets a lot of different things done in a day or in a short period of time in the next group agreeableness individualism is a trait that deserves a bit of explanation so individualism refers to how strongly a person holds his own opinions a low scorer is looking around a lot and follows the guidance of others and doesn't form strong opinions on on his own or on her own as a positive the person is very open to guidance and easily can change his her opinion given a good reason the potential risk side of the trait would be maybe lacking independent thinking or independent judgment and relying too much on others the high score the right score would show somebody who is following strongly his own or her own judgment and not easy to change his opinion in some situations that would appear as stubborn in some uh, situations it would appear as somebody goes his her own way and for example can resist group pressure and can do the right thing so again it has uh, good and bad sides 
as well. We see high individualism scores, for example, for some uh, technical experts and entrepreneurs. And low individualism score very often appears with people who are very interdependent and um, very good team workers and they do brainstorming and source ideas from the environment. And the other interesting trait is in the final block openness, the final trait observation. This trait is very innovative too. We kind of borrowed it from emotional intelligence. There's a trait approach to emotional intelligence and there is a trait that describes someone's sensitivity to nonverbal messages. So the high score, the right score of observation indicates a behavior that somebody pays attention to nonverbals and reads people and puts emphasis and spends time of observing human subtleties while a low scorer pays less attention doesn't put so much emphasis on the norm verbal messages of others so these were the traits that are a little bit uh, different from everyday language and again you find the definitions in your report and in the other literature so by now you understand the personality model of trait map Another very important aspect of any questionnaire, personality test, is the questionnaire itself. How do we measure this model? And the model and the questionnaire really should go hand in hand. They are inseparable. They are like branches and leaves of a tree. Without leaves, branches make no sense. And without branches, there are no leaves. And the leaves are where the branches are, right? So they are really inseparable. So here is an example. If you did the questionnaire, you remember this is the first block. And you see five items. And you need to rank them. You need to sort them based on which are more like you, which are less like you. And this shows our philosophy that there is really no right and wrong answers. If you look at these five items, there is really no big quality difference in people if they put one up and one down. These are just the individual differences that are in the normal range but they don't make anybody more or less valuable regardless where they put these items regardless how they how they rank them and the other very important concept is it's a forced choice format a forced choice questionnaire you need to make decisions you cannot put everything up or everything down or uh, put everything in the middle you have to sort the items according to this order relatively to each other which is more like you more typical and which is less for you as an administrator as a facilitator who works with people who administers the trade map questionnaire it's very important for you to understand the fourth choice format and its implica uh, implications so you can properly interpret the report and you can make proper feedback and proper decisions. So in summary, we can say about this ranking format that one, with this format, there are really no right and wrong answers. And that makes faking it very difficult. It requires quite some efforts to put the one to the top to adjust the order and 
it's not so easy to kind of see through and control the results and the questionnaire and especially people who don't know the model behind it is quite an effort and what is interesting when people do this questionnaire everybody feels that yeah i know i see what i do what i put up what i what i put down yet there's always some surprise in the results and this is because actually the combinations are so numerous that nobody can really keep in mind where did i put what 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 was coming at me so when you are filling in this question actually you are only partly conscious about your choices many choices are happening subconsciously and this is the big advantage of this questionnaire that some of the choices that you do will bypass your conscious decisions and this allows you to see a little bit below the surface to see the part of the iceberg that is usually hidden trait map cut through this, the surface behavior layer and maps the deeper enduring personality patterns the fourth choice format of trait map has these definite advantages and in, at the same time it also has some limitations and there is some critic to fourth choice questionnaire in general some of the critics is valid and some of the critics not really valid for trait map so i'd like to talk about the critics and about the limitations and uh, how does it appear in trait map the first critic of fourth choice questionnaires is that the total point that people score is fixed the same for everybody so for example in the case of trait map we have 21 traits and you will put certain questions up in the same time you must put certain things down so the scores will be same it will it's a fourth distribution and in the case of trait map because the average from 1 to 10 and a stand uh, if you're using stance 5.5 is the average we have 25 traits so that's roughly 138 points so everybody on the 25 traits if we add up their scores everybody scores the same the critics what they say about this is well here we have a fixed the same score for everybody but when we look at behavior people are different some people in general in the related behaviors of the 25 traits totally would would perform at a higher level and some people would perform in total at a lower level however this critic in our system in our definition of personality is not correct this critic stems from the fact that people don't differentiate between personality and behavior and i'd like to ask you to remember the performance prediction formula that we already introduced at the beginning of this presentation here it is again so performance equals behavior of a longer period of time and that can be predicted by individual qualities what we bring in so that's in the bracket multiplied by motivation and the platform the environment the leadership the product and so on the situational factors and inside in the bracket are the things that the individual brings in i'd like to focus a little bit more and talk more about these individual qualities in the bracket i'd like to start with a question which one of these is the easiest to develop yeah that's right knowledge the one on the right knowledge is the easiest to develop and then would be probably skills but skills require more repetition requires doing and experience and eq is also something that we can train and develop 
and personality change is already much slower and IQ from the viewpoint of corporations and adult life even though it can be improved but it's out of the realm of what companies do so we can see that things on the left are more steady and things on the right are easier to develop we can also analyze these individual qualities from another point of view which are the ones where people really score at different levels let me rephrase this for example IQ we know that some people score higher some people score lower IQ can be represented by one single number the general mental ability and we know that it's uh, normally distributed in the population so we can imagine that if we would have 100 people it would be very easy if you would know their if you would know their IQ score we could line them up by let's say people with the lower score on the left and then higher 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 to the top on the right so it is possible to sort people based on their IQ score it is reasonable that some people have higher level of IQ some people have lower level of IQ how does it work for knowledge can we say and this is regardless of context that some people have more knowledge than others yes probably that's very reasonable to assume actually IQ is also related with knowledge so probably higher IQ will also predict higher knowledge but yeah some people have all in all more knowledge some people have all in all less how about skills also regardless of context is it fair to say that some people have more skills some people have less yeah it is fair to say EQ is the same and how about personality can we say that somebody has more personality than others higher personality lower personality or more personality less personality does it make sense hmm that's an interesting question so most people intuitively would say not really personality is about your unique characteristics it's not like it's not a level thing and we the authors of trade map we also share this that personality is in a way egalitarian that we have the equal amount total amount of the traits just like everybody has 24 hours a day an equal amount of minutes and seconds the only difference is how we spend them so we have the equal amount of personality we just have uh, more traits here but then we will have less traits there so this seems to intuitively makes uh, making sense that with personality the total level is actually the same for everybody and that's why the force choice format for personality is a good format of measuring it it's about inclination it's about proclivity it's not about the performance level the performance level the level differences are decided by IQ EQ skills knowledge and motivation and situ situational factors there there are different levels so that brings in the in the different levels in the uh, total sum and not personality and you can ask okay but if the personality total is the same for everybody why do we have it in the formula then it's a constant <laughs> right it's the same for everybody so it doesn't really matter it doesn't make any difference at the performance how, how is how is that right you can ask that question so actually when we apply personality in the performance prediction formula it is the personality job match so when we have a context when we talk about 
a specific job, then we can analyze which traits are supporting this job, which traits are irrelevant or maybe even counterproductive. We can set the ideal personality profile and then we can see how the personality of the candidates matching this profile. IQ is generic, EQ is generic, but skills also, when we look at this formula, skills also have to be applied for the relevant job skills. And knowledge is also the relevant knowledge. Motivation will be also specific for, for this position. And also the situational factors will be specific. So only, I, only IQ and EQ are kind of truly universal, regardless almost of the context, as personality, skills and knowledge and so on, has to be put in the context of the job enabled to predict performance. Trade map actually has a function to calculate the personality job match. You can create the ideal job profile for the specific position and the system automatically can calculate the degree of match. Another critic of the fourth choice questionnaire format is about interaction between the items. So when we have five items in a block, then a choice of one will have an impact on the other and this causes distortion. If you look at the screen again, we can see that, for example, here we have five items. I seldom get angry. It is an item from emotional control, actually. I like to take charge of situations. This is coming from extroversion. This is for assertiveness. I care a lot about other people. This is altruism item. I'm very ambitious. Item from drive, from the focus dimension. I love to try new things. This is an item from progressiveness and from the openness dimension. Every item belongs to a trait and comes from a different big five dimensions. And yeah, if I put something up, for example, I want to move, I'm very ambitious, as more like me, to put it up, then something must come down. There is interaction between the items and this is a valid point of criticism. This is creating some distortions. This is inherent with the fourth choice questionnaire. So what we did is we minimized this bias, we minimized this distortion and we kind of spread it around evenly. And uh, this is where we use combinatorial optimization, a mathematical method, to reduce the impact between the traits. I can simply kind of explain the principle, how it works. So here we can see that an item from emotional control, from assertiveness, from altruism, from drive and from progressiveness had some kind of interaction with each other. And with the, in the questionnaire, what we did is we made sure that these five items will never get together again in the same block. So items from emotional control will never be in the same block with items from assertiveness and so on. So there is no this systematic distortion will not add up because any distortion can occur only once in the questionnaire. And we did a little bit more. We balanced it out. So emotional control, for example, will be compared with all the other traits from the other big five dimensions. It will be compared with everyone, with every other trait. We make sure that it is every trait is compared with every other trait from the other big five dimensions. But it is, com it is compared only once. We can model the questionnaire as a 
boxing championship to find out the ranking order of the participants of this boxing competition we have 25 participants the 25 traits and we want to find out who is the top we want to find the cardinal traits right uh, who are in the middle and who are at the bottom so if it would be a competition you want you would want to have a fair competition so that would mean that um, a random factor like who starts to compete with whom should not impact the final results of the competition and you can imagine if everybody would fight with everybody then it would be a very fair and balanced competition and basically this is what we done so we make sure that every trait is compared with every other trait in the case of trait map the only difference from this metaphor is that uh, traits will be compared only from other traits from the other big five dimensions so um, every trait will be compared with 20 other traits and we achieve this by using combinatorial op optimization and there are some other optimization various levels of optimization to make the questionnaire very balanced which I cannot uh, simply explain but this one is the most important and the third critics of the fourth choice questionnaire format that if you have a reasonable amount of traits for a sophisticated personality model so you have a broadband personality inventory in our case we have 25 then the questionnaire must be long because you want to reduce the bias you need to have you need to gather enough information and enough uh, deviation so this questionnaire must be long and here again our format is a breakthrough because we achieved the fourth choice questionnaire format with 25 traits in a quite short or probably in a very short compared to what it does way by the combinatorial optimization by the five item ranking blocks and the median time of completing trait map is 70 minutes so many people competed below 15 minutes which is really a breeze there are some frequently asked questions about personality so let's address them one how is personality formed nature or nurture and you know, here you can just uh, google it we go with the consensus most people would say it's both where nurture playing a bigger role and the early years childhood young adulthood play a bigger role and as we go along and getting more mature our personality usually changes less unless there are major changes in the environment and this is very related to the second question can personality be changed or developed this is maybe the most often asked question and my personal take on it is personality can change and does change however for working adults this change is slow because personality is an abstract concept it is some kind of summary of the past it can change dramatically when there are dramatic changes in the environment and one's lifestyle there are such big changes for example when somebody maybe leaves home and goes somewhere else to study in a university and lives in a student dormitory that's a big change and usually some changes happen and then when somebody after graduation starts to work and then has very different environment and expectations and lifestyle 
change can be also to have children and so on but the older we get the changes usually are smaller it is documented that there can be big changes for soldiers people who've been drafted and went to some war to fight and came back quite changed sometimes learning training skills peak experiences can also bring personality breakthroughs and very positive changes so personality can change and does change slowly however that being said i would say don't try to change your personality our task regarding to our personality is to understand and accept because personality is basically where we are now what is our emotional baggage what is that we have inside what is not easily changeable and how can we work best with it so our development goals should be about skills about habits about behavior to increase our self-awareness develop new skills use new tools our development goals should not be aimed at changing our personality and as our behavior changes our skills are changing maybe we will see also some changes in the trade map reports i've been looking trade map reports for more than 15 years and i had the privilege to do trade map with the same people sometimes in a time gap of five years or or even more and my own report it did change some and that those changes can be explained how my career developed or the other people that i know what happened in their life and where they were there were some changes however the basic shape of the profile was very similar and these changes were let's say from three went up to five or from nine dropped down to seven in this range not from left to right so the changes that i have seen are quite minor personality as far as trade map measures it is quite steady concept and the third question how can we use the trade map results i have two answers for that as a long-term strategy we should arrange our work and life that it is aligned with our cardinal traits with our main tendencies with our main preferences so that we can use our strengths and we can minimize those tests that would require to be far stretched out from our home base and on the short term we can analyze how does our personality support the current requirements of our role of our job where are the areas where we need to perform but our person doesn't support us too much where are the gaps and how can we deal with that how can we address that and then we can address it by using tools changing our habits learning new skills or rearranging our tasks pairing up with somebody who can take care of those areas so we can do adjustments around it so here the idea is not changing the personality but given my personality traits given what i have and the things that it is, are not easy to change okay how do i work around that how can i meet the requirements of my current role the report helps me to identify what skills do i need to learn or develop and what habits do i need to change now let's walk through the key pages of the trade map report the first one on the left is the big five report this report shows 
your scores on the big five, your main preferences, your main tendencies using the five trait model. The next page in the report, trait map highlights, highlights your cardinal traits. From this report, we leave out the traits that are central, five scoring five and six, and we include the traits that are the furthest from the midpoint of 5.5. So for example, we can see that the most dominant traits for Judy Sample are observation, dutifulness, cooperation, methodicalness, and so on, because there is a definite tendency to the right. When the score is 8, 9, 10, there's a clear tendency. And then we have tendencies to left score behavior also, health management, abstractedness, assertiveness, calmness, and so on. Here we have a clear tendency to left score behavior. So these are the cardinal traits. These are the traits that influence most the behavior. Why not the middle ones? Because when the score is 5, 6, it's flexible, it's like most people, so these are not the unique characteristics of Judy Sample. Further from the midpoint are the unique characteristics of Judy Sample. The next page in the report shows the full trade map personality profile, shows all the scores for the 25 traits. This is the page I like to use most for providing feedback in a recruitment interview. Later on, I'm going to talk more about that. The work attributes report is very useful for recruitment, talent management, career development, career consulting purposes. This report very clearly shows which are the areas where Judy Sample has her gift, has her most talent, which are the areas, which are the fields where she can perform high and she can also enjoy high job satisfaction, and which are the areas where she feel less comfortable, which are further from her home base. And we can see that Judy is a flexible person, service orientation, communication, sales orientation, are all supported well by personality, probably wouldn't feel most comfortable in leadership positions yet, tolerates well routine work, follows instructions, that's very easy and natural for her, adaptability, flexibility, emotional expression, yeah, she is a person easy to communicate with, she has definite drive and energy and reading people again. She is good in people-oriented roles as well. And we can see that abstract thinking, so highly technical, complex jobs, creative problem solving is not the strength, leadership role as we talked about, and also stress tolerance, so probably positions which come with lots of stress, risks would be tiring for her. And we can also see another scale, burnout risk, 9, and this shows that from her profile we can calculate a kind of balance. There are traits that are charging, for example, health management, the most important one, and there are traits that are depleting our energies. For example, drive, for example, dutifulness or altruism these are using our energies and here we calculate a balance and we can see that from the viewpoint of personality judy is at a higher risk of burnout so i would advise her to take care of her health and increase her health management the next report the team role report is also based on combined skills, combining primary traits to calculate some tendencies according to the team role model. There are many different team role models and they are very similar. They have 
six, eight, nine, somewhat similar team roles that we used here. And this is very useful for team building, team development, but also for career development because we see which are the roles most suitable for Judy. The next report, conflict style report, is designed for training, for providing conflict management skills trainings. I personally used this report a lot. I was delivering um, many conflict management skills trainings and these reports were fantastic. We used the Harvard model of conflicts to design this report, which is also very, very similar to the Thomas Kilman uh, model. And it's very intuitive, very easy to use. There are many exercises around these reports, uh, very practical, working very well. In this report, the higher disk area shows more tendency, more inclination to certain conflict styles. The next report, Collaboration Skills Report, is also for trainings. It can be used again for team development, collaboration skills training. Then we have Presentation Skills Report, obviously for presentation skills training. We have reports for negotiation skills training, for sales training. A leadership style report for leadership training and trade map also offers individualized development suggestions based on the personality profile the last page of the report is statistical data here we see when was the report generated when did the person start the questionnaire when did she finish and we see some numbers that I want to explain a little bit in the green brackets. So test length is the time Judy took to fill in the questionnaire. And 70 minutes is a fairly average, close to median time. The fastest blocks show which blocks did she process the faster. So the 22nd she completed in 17 seconds. The 19 was submitted in 20 seconds. So these are the fast blocks. And here I like to see, is there something really low? So below 10 seconds would be way too fast. If somebody submits it in three seconds, definitely didn't read the block, the items very well. And it would be very suspicious. The slowest blocks show which blocks she took the longest time. And here we can see that the sixth block took 3 minutes 20 seconds. And if we compare that to Judy's median block length, 32 seconds, we can see that this was much longer. And we see the other blocks. Q25 took 1 minute 22 seconds. The third block took 1 minute. So the 3 minutes 20 seconds is way too much. So maybe she at this time went out to drink a cup of coffee or had a quick phone call we don't know but probably something happened at that point so the test length the fastest blocks slowest blocks and median block length give us some data to understand how was the testing process how did the process flow in time and centeredness is a very interesting validity scale. It shows something about how valid, how reliable is the report. What is centeredness? Well, centeredness is an indicator that shows if the profile, the 25 traits, if it's very centered, then we have many 5, 6 in the report. We know that the total average for everyone is 5.5. So definitely we cannot have a report where everybody is 8, 9, 10 or a report where everybody is 1, 2, 3. The total average will be always around 5.5. But we can have reports where all the traits are very close to the center. 4, 5, 6, 3, but basically 
very centered and this report doesn't contain a lot of information it doesn't highlight what are the cardinal traits and this kind of very high centeredness when it's 8 9 10 it shows that there's very little information in the report the person took probably not very seriously or really doesn't have a clue about his her own behavior maybe it's a sign of very low awareness or wanted to manipulate something or or did it very randomly high centeredness is showing that there's not enough consistency in the responses there is very high degree of randomness and there is little information in the report so again 8 9 10 the report is not usable it's very unlikely and something went wrong with that profile so here judy has a centeredness score of two so his profile is very delineated not centered the trends are very clear she responded in a consistent manner except for the individual reports trait map also offers a wide range of group reports here i'm just showing a few examples so for example the conflict style tendencies can map all the participants based on their conflict style we have two axes the vertical is assertive the horizontal is compromising and that makes a space which creates four quadrants and these quadrants are conflict styles avoiding forcing collaborating and accommodating and people will be put into the right quadrant based on their personality profile you can generate the group reports anonym or with initials and the initials are showing who is who the leadership orientation report could be used for talent management selection or leadership skills training the task people orientation for management skills trainings and the skills averages show what is unique about this team it can be used for team development for organizational development purposes now i'd like to talk more about the trade map applications and one of the most popular applications is analyzing job fit for recruitment succession planning career development you can analyze how well the trait map profile is matches the ideal job profile so on the right you see a job fit report and this time this report is for the sales manager position so before we generated this report we implemented we created an ideal job profile for sales manager which means we selected which traits are important and in those important traits there is the ideal range what is the range that we'd like to see the results so that the performance is bestly supported by the personality trait this example also shows that it's not always the higher higher trait is better for example for cooperation here we want the score in the middle range you will find some ideal job profiles already programmed in the system based on our, on our own experience however we encourage you to create your own profiles for your jobs and positions because what is the exact requirement can really depend on the industry the company size the maturity of the company the details of the position the od2 system calculates a job fit score for everybody so for example here is 61 percent the job fit score shows how close is the profile to the ideal profile 100 percent would be 
all scores are in the green fields in the ideal expected ranges. A score of 1% would be all the scores are as far from the ideal ranges as possible. A 61% is showing that the distance from the ideal profile range is around one third or roughly two third close is the person to the ideal profile and we can see also the gaps so for example we can see that in optimism the gap is very big and also other crucial traits like assertiveness and persuasiveness is also a significant gap and we can see that from the viewpoint of cooperation, creativity, progressiveness, the person is right there in the expected range. And also there are many traits where the gap is not big. However, there are also major gaps. And how we would use this uh, report? So if you have many applicants, then you can use this for a quick screening then you would select only the people who are close to the expected profile if you have a few applicants and you cannot really choose between them then you can combine this with an interview and you can address the areas of the gaps deeper you can dig there deeper you can have more behavior event questions so you can feed these data points into your interview and this way your interview will become much more targeted. And in the same amount of interview time you can gather much better information about the person. Except for selection, development is also a very important area of trait map applications. Our users use StraightMap for team building workshops, leadership workshops, conflict management training, presentation, negotiation, sales skills training and coaching. StraightMap adds value to these development processes by increasing self-awareness, making the learning more personal and coaches love this because the coaching conversation much quicker gets much deeper and trade map helps to surface the real issues and very quickly the coach can work with the coachee about topics that really matter in the next section of this lecture i want to talk about some practical advices when you work with people this little model will help you to address issues when you are talking with people face to face. I created this little model inspired by the Johari window and this is a little spin on that more applied to the context when you the assessment facilitator is working with somebody let it be a recruitment uh, so you work with a candidate or you work with a coachee or a training participant. So when it's about personality, nobody knows the absolute truth. Everybody has some limited view on personality because, yeah, people are a miracle. They are multidimensional, complex beings. We are capable of amazing things. We are also capable of horrible things. Everybody's head is carrying a model of the universe with him. So we are very complex. And it doesn't matter what method we use. We have just a limited understanding of ourselves. So we can have only different perspectives on personality. One perspective is the self-perceived view, the inner view of how I see myself, my own self-image. Another view on my personality is the self-presented self, the show, this is what I would like others to see when they are interacting with me. And there is another perspective, the observed self, the outer view, this is what other people see when they are interacting with me. And the trait map profile 
brings in another view, a mirror view. In the mirror of the trait map questionnaire, this is my personality. So there are four different perspectives. Which is more true? Where is the real self? Where is the true representation of the personality? These are philosophical questions and I think the most practical to say that each view adds to the picture, adds to the puzzle. And I like to ask you to think about the overlaps of these different views. And I give you an example. Let's say person A between the self-perceived view and the self-presented view, let's say the overlap is very high. The person has a self-image which she is very comfortable with and very happy to show that to others. Very open to show that to others. And the others, let's say in this case, will observe something similar, especially if time is longer. And then the person, if he she was open to fill in the trait map questionnaire, then the trait map profile will also show something similar. So for person A, the overlaps are high. And imagine now a person B, where the overlaps are very little. Of course, we may not know, we may never know what is the self-perceived view, the self-image. We may also not know what was really the intention, what the person wanted really to present. We have the outer view from the outside and the trait map. And if we see that there's a big difference, what does it tell about person B? If we compare person B to person A, what can we say? We can say that a higher overlap is a sign of high EQ, high authenticity, self-acceptance and the openness to share. And in my experience and experience of many users, the high overlap is a better candidate. And when we say there is no right and wrong about personality profiles, yeah, there, there is no right and wrong in the profile itself. But there is some kind of right when the person, the profile, and what I see when I interact with the person, matches. is through the interview what in the person, the profile, can be observed with stories, can be confirmed with my observation. That is definitely a good sign. And if there would be big discrepancies, big gaps that I may or may not be able to ever explain, that is not a good sign for a candidate. Now, having that theoretical foundation, some practical tips. So before people take the assessment, how to communicate with them? I would emphasize, tell them the purpose, why you are requested to do this questionnaire. Tell them what will happen with the result. Will it be shared? Who will see this? Will there be a feedback? If the participant is a candidate for recruitment, then the best to tell them that it's not a single decision base, it's a reference material, it will be validated with an interview. We will also look at your self-knowledge, how well you know yourself. But of course, what you say here will depend on your recruitment process. It will depend on which stage are you going to use trait map. You are using it with many applicants as a quick screening or you are using it at a later stage where it will be combined with an interview. As for instructions, you don't need to give many instructions because everything is written, everything is clear when the person will do the assessment so just keep it very simple tell them read carefully answer the questions intuitively make the ranking intuitively and provide a true picture of yourself as much as you can and then just provide some specifics of your assessment process when 
will be the next step, when will the person receive the code, and so on. In a feedback interview for recruitment, you can use the profile, the full profile, if you have more time and if it's a higher level position, or you can use the highlights if you have less time. You give a printed page of just that one page and you explain how to understand the scores. You explain that in trade map, because it's a fourth choice questionnaire, the total average for everyone is 5.5. So for every higher score or right score, there's also a left score. Nobody can score all high or all low in our questionnaire. You explain them that behavior is flexing. The number that we see here is the home base, the most natural or comfortable state, but not necessarily the behavior that the person will display at work. You explain them that it is, this is about inclination, proclivity. So after a few sentences, give them a marker and ask them that if they see any discrepancy, something that is surprising, something that they would put themselves uh, differently, tell them to mark it where they think the score should be. This usually takes two minutes for people to go through and mark if, if they need to mark it somewhere. Some people say, yeah, I think this is quite quite fine, this is quite accurate, I'm, I'm okay with it. Or some people say, well, here or there, I would put it differently. And when there are discrepancies, then you should ask, okay, could you give me an example? Could you example for this trait? Very often, the example will reveal that actually they misunderstood the trait, and you can correct that and say, oh, what you say, for example, you wanted to upgrade your assertiveness score, but what you describe is confidence. And this is our understanding of assert assertiveness, for example. So you can clarify and then people say, oh yeah, I see now. Yeah, then it is fine. Or maybe the person can convince you that actually, yeah, it's true, the score is let's say four, but he performs that at a very high level. And then it could be because he has an inclination to left score, but maybe has the awareness and the skills and the motivation to perform as an eight. Or maybe we happen to find one trait which had an error in it, because every measurement has an error range a normal range of error in trait map would be a score difference of 1, 2 or 3 in 1, 2 or 3 traits. This can happen because of our fourth choice questionnaire and with any instrument there is a little range of error. If you think about our measurement range, it's the maximum range is 10 times 25, so 250. And the error is 0, let's say person says it's very good, to 3 times 3, 9. So that is the error range that is normal, so 9 compared to the 250, the total range that, that scores can take in the report. But anyway, back to what do you do with people. After they marked it, you ask some questions and in a recruitment you don't necessarily want to convince the person what is, uh, what is the real score or what are your observations. You just make observations, you understand the person better and you move on. Before the recruitment, you did your ideal profile either in the system or you just thought about what are the important traits for this position. And you can use the interview guide where there are questions that you can ask and observation points that you can use to observe the behavior in front of you around those traits.
you will experience that the trade map report gives lots of depth and strength to your interviews. And just the same way, meeting the person, having an interview will give lots of text and colors and meat to the trade map report. In the recruitment, when you combine trade map with an interview, def you definitely will experience one plus one is bigger than two. I want to use this slide to explain the logic when you need to make decisions how you integrate trade map with your interview observations in a case of a recruitment process. So you had a recruitment interview with the candidate. I'm going to take one example trait confidence. So let's say that person A has a low score in trade map on confidence and had a low performance on the interview in confidence. So confidence is something very easy to observe in an interview. You can see it as the person walks in, shakes the hands or not. The tonality, the body language gives it away very quickly. So confidence is a great trait to validate the report because it's so obvious. Person B, in our example, has high trade map score and high interview performance. So the body language, the tonality is showing confidence, deep, true confidence. And you see a nine score on trade map. Person C has high trade map score, but on the interview, what you observe, the observed behavior, gives away low confidence, demonstrates low confidence. You, you see lack of confidence in the body language and in the tonality. And let's say there is also person D with a low trade map score, scored only two, but the behavior that you observe shows very high self-confidence. So we have four examples, person A, B, C, and D. So when you integrate trade map with interview performance, what are the judgments that you make? Person A, we can say that consistent. Trade map and the interview behavior is consistent and confidence is low. Now, if the position requires high amount of confidence, then that is there is a gap there. So that's about person A. Person B, also consistent. The score and the interview behavior are similar. That's a good sign. Kind of the, the validity of the report was confirmed by the behavior. So the trade map view and the observed view, the outer view are close. That is a good sign. If confidence is important for the job, that's uh, even good. Yeah, the candidate ticked that box. If confidence is not important, also no problem, but the report was validated. What can we say about candidate C? High trade map score but the observed performance is low. Here we see a gap. We don't know the reason for this gap, but one thing is sure. The person wanted to show high confidence, and if somebody wants to fake a questionnaire, confidence, assertiveness are usually the traits where they try to boost them a little bit, because this is supposed to be quite widely known as goodies, as, as good things. So maybe the person wanted to show more confidence because understands that he's not strong in confidence so he was faking a little bit and that shows low self-acceptance low eq it's a gap it is definitely something not positive about this candidate and what about candidate d is it possible is it likely well first of all 
it's very seldom. Candidate C is seldom, but D is very seldom. But what would that mean if there is such a big gap? It would mean that even though the internal inclination, the internal experience of the person compared to the other traits that he or she is not confident. And maybe she struggled with confidence. However, she has the skills, she has the awareness, she has the motivation that she can perform a high level of confidence on the behavior level. Even though personality maybe doesn't support her too much. That shows that that person has a high level of skills, very talented, has energy, the behavior is flexible. And if the treatment profile otherwise is well aligned with her tendencies, with her strengths and weaknesses, maybe we just see that, yeah, even the weak areas, the performance is very high because it's a very talented person. So the question, if a high confidence is required in this position, which candidate is the best? Well, A definitely not, C definitely not, but would we pick B or D? Well, if everything else would be equal, I would say B is better, because if this is important for us, then the internal inclination is well aligned with the job, so the job fit is higher, and D even though can perform, but maybe the inclination would be at some other place. Well, if everything else would, would be equal. Now in practice, we will see that there are very talented people who can perform at a high range, even at the areas of personality weakness. And that is good, and usually the good, the good candidates have that quality. In this example, I put A, B, C, D into the four corners to dramatize the situations that you may come across. And in practice, you will come across probably more smooth situations. But having this understanding, you will be able to make the correct decision in any time, any case. Okay, let's look at now the application of development. So you are sitting down with the participant as part of a development process, coaching, or you're providing feedback. In such a setting, it is very important to focus on the person and use questions. After some small talk, I will start by asking, do you remember taking the questionnaire? You know, when was it? Do you remember the process? How was it? Is there anything sticking out of memory? Most people say, no, nothing really, nothing special. Why, I'm, why am I asking? And I just ask, if they ask me why am I asking, that's a great sign. And I would say, you know, this is just a standard question to see if, if, if there was anything that may have influenced how you answered. And some people will say, yeah, you know, I remember that some of those blog, the ranking was quite difficult and and I you know I, I hesitated and I couldn't find the best. I wanted to put two up or, or more down, but I couldn't. So I had to submit a blog that I think wasn't ideal or a few blogs that wasn't ideal. And that is also normal. This is how our questionnaire works. And then you can tell them, yeah, understand, uh, this is how for choice questionnaires work. And because the question is quite balanced, usually these errors are leveling out and don't add up. But again, most people will say, no, it was quite smooth, everything was fine. So you can move to the next question. Okay, you read the report. How was it for you? If they are open, 
that's enough and they are going over the talk and tell you a lot how they see the report where is it accurate where maybe they were surprised and so on and so on most people will say yeah i found it quite accurate if they don't tell much i ask them how accurate do you find the report and if they say oh very accurate what most people do then it's fine but they say oh i have some questions here okay so then I give them the marker and I ask them if they see any discrepancy, draw it on the profile, on the highlights, depending on which one I use, depending on the time, and asking them, yeah, where are the discrepancies? Can they give examples? A great question is to ask, okay, you read the report, what gave you the deepest impression? When people are very open, maybe just for how was the report for you, they already give away what is the issue, what is the central theme, the central topic, what are they most sensitive about, what is mostly resonating, what is moving them. And then that's where you work, that's where the energy is. But some people need a little bit more time and space to open up, and this is a great question that can help. And you work where the energy is. So maybe what gave you the deepest impression will give you enough. Or how, was, how is the report for you will already give you enough. And, the, and you don't have to walk through the whole report because you have enough to work on. And your session meets its purpose. And if you have more time or you didn't find the re real issues to work on, then you walk through the cardinal trait. You explain each of them, or actually it's written there, so you ask how does it appear in your life? You see your score, could you give an example? How is it in at, at your work? What are the implications? So you ask questions as you walk through the report. And as you walk through the report or the cardinal traits with questions, probably you will find where the energy is, what are the areas where you want to dig deeper and work with the participant. At the later stage, you can ask, to what degree can you use your strengths in your current position? And this opens up the application of, okay, how can you utilize your greatest strength? How can you utilize them more? And this is a very good, very fruitful area. Spend time on this. And usually the previous questions already bring up the gaps. And usually that's very easy, happens quite early in the process. But if not, and you went through the whole process and there are still, you don't see where are the gaps and where is the energy, then you can ask this question. Are there any gaps between the requirements of your current job and your personality preferences? Now in trade map, nobody is perfect, just as in real life. There's, there are no perfect people. And definitely these traits and scores will highlight something where people can work more on themselves, where they can improve more. And when you go through these questions, when you use just some of these questions, definitely you will have enough to work on. And then the rest is just normal coaching. You are using your coaching skills when you found, found the area to develop a goal, a vision for the person and to set some action steps and an action plan. And with that we covered feedback for recruitment and for development and feedback is a skill so you need to practice it with this preparation you are ready so just trust it just start the process work with people work with people that are easy easy to work with at the beginning to gain confidence and to get better at it and then you can pick up the challenging cases 
And I'd like to close with a few thoughts about confidentiality and ethics. This is very standard, very aligned with the American Psychological Association, but all over the world, this is basically common sense. So never publish a report or show a report in public with a real name. Only give the report to people who are clearly concerned with such matters. Those HR or line managers who are involved in the process, who are going to use it. And if needed, explain them how to read the report. Fortunately, a trade map report is quite easy to read, yet you may need to point out certain things like the forced choice questionnaire, that the results are forcedly distributed, there's a forced distribution, they should not look for the person who scores high on everything in trade map and so on. And then the last one, you will learn about certain weaknesses of others, people will open up to you and you get gather deep information of people. So this is our privilege, our honor to work people deeper and we need to appreciate that and never abuse that. The only purpose we want to use this information and want to use these tools is to help the person, help the individual and help the organization and that's it. Well, thank you for watching this video. It was a lot of content and I hope that it will be useful and it will help you to be a great facilitator of assessments and I wish you a lot of success and joy by using TradeMap. Thank you.